So in this next module on uh, testing complex software, um, we we move on and talk about um, what happens when your project becomes more advanced. At, at the stage where you're looking at these ideas, you should be thinking about a project that already has um, that's already has documented functionality and some initial tests are written um, and things are learning, starting to look good. You have a little bit of infrastructure in place, but now you're wondering where do you go from here? How do you improve your testing situation to the point where it's considered done? Let's think about this problem as selecting the right tests. So if we take a step back um, from the, the whole nuts and bolts uh, picture of testing, there are two kind of levels of tests that I want to point out. There are tests that are meant to be kind of long running uh, that you schedule and are, are there to provide a comprehensive coverage. And there are tests that are, are there in order to provide a, a quick diagnosis of error. And these are usually, I'm thinking about these as continuous integration tests because they give you a, um, because they give you a quick way to find um, defects in your code that, that will you know, break your build or, or do something or make some, some silly mistakes that you can find quickly. Um, and those are great candidates for continuous integration. Um, there are also different granularities of tests. And, and by granularity here, I mean something that looks at a small chunk of your code or a unit test um, and isolates a component or a subcomponent and things that are, are at a higher level, which are more integration tests that have um, that test the interfaces between modules or that that make sure that the functionality of the whole is as it's expected. You also, if you have a code which can check when and restart, would have things like restart tests or tests that look at the interaction between the way you run the code, like say in a batch scheduler or your your particular operating system, um, or if your code does any network operations. These are kind of the, the high scale, high level continuous integration type tests. Uh, simple rules of thumb for selecting tests is that you want your uh, your tests to be as simple as possible and to enable you to quickly pinpoint the source of the error. If you, um, if you write a test that, that says it, your code works or doesn't work, but <clears throat> it's very complex and has lots of moving pieces inside of it, it's not a very good test um, because you want your test to actually be able to say something about where the fault occurred um, in order to be useful. A little bit more on why you don't always want the most stringent testing. Um, you might be tempted to get overly creative with test cases or turn every possible scenario into a test. Um, that can actually be counterproductive because time that's spent on creating and maintaining and interpreting tests takes away team resources. Ideally, tests are closely aligned with your science objectives. And then the tests themselves um, not only test your code, but they provide baselines. Um, they're motivating to create and maintain because every time you're looking at the test, you're looking at you know, the simple basic science that your code does. Um, and if testing gets too far away from that, it tends to distract the project team uh, away from achieving its next great features. On the other hand, if there isn't enough testing, then defects in the code can start to slip through. For example, users might assume that the overlap between uh, processors is communicated directly during a halo exchange. And that's what's shown in the bottom right here. Um, you have kind of in a domain decomposition, um, a code that does domain decomposition. Then you have maybe two different MPI ranks that have, have their uh, cells that they're in charge of updating that are in red. And then they have halo cells that are in blue that are the, the external cells that they need to know about but they haven't created the update for those cells. And in a halo exchange, um, rank two will send its, its overlapping halo to rank three and rank three will send its overlapping halo to rank two. Um, in this sort of a halo exchange, um, there's no test that tries it out with varying halo size. There's not a way to know when the assumption that the halo exchange works breaks down. Um, and so you really wanna have um, all the assumptions of your code and all the assumptions, and you can even think about this as assumptions at a function level or at a module level. Each one of those assumptions, um, if, it's, if it's important, ought to be uh, tested. So let's see, uh, this leads you to the idea of creating a team meeting that's focused specifically on a testing plan. Um, the goal of this kind of team meeting is to clearly map out 
the expected uses of the code. Um, what are the really important use cases? What parts of the code are critical to the long-term stability of your code? Um, and here's where you have to, you know, combine tests with planning because if you start testing features that are, you know, the ones that are at the, the top of your mind, those might not actually be the, the features that are, are the most stable and, um, you know, most basic for, for ensuring um, kind of the, the, that the base functionality of your code works. And you really want to focus your testing effort on the stable core of your code. Um, so who on the team? Um, <clears throat> who on the team should be responsible for ensuring that each piece of the code works? Um, are there additional difficulties coming from the interactions between modules? And how can these be reasonably addressed with example use cases? If, if you can do that in one team meeting, then your team is, is working better than, than any of the teams that I've been on. These are difficult problems. Um, and usually you know, having regular meetings and addressing testing in those regular meetings is um, something that should just become a fact of life. Um, as your code becomes more complex and difficult, it's important to, to have a clear strategy for these things. Additional notes on good testing practices um, are that you, you also want to be doing things like verifying your code coverage and um, you know, having people watching the test suite. You don't necessarily have to have those people who are watching the test suite um, be responsible for fixing all the errors. That would be way too much work. But the people who are watching it should at least um, you know, know of issues and kind of, if possible, um, send lots of reminders and bug the people whose who's, uh, code that um, is responsible for fixing, that fixing the, the bugs that are reported. Um, you can also double check your work with the code coverage tool. You can create a policy on what to do with failed tests and marked issues with bugs. Um, you should consider your test suite during refactorings and use it for the code release process. Um, and that is, you should run your tests obviously before during code releases, but during refactorings, those tests will tell you whether or not you've broken something major. Cost effectiveness comes in here because if you already have defined functionalities and tests, it's much less likely that your team will get sidetracked by maintaining uh, bug fixes and patches for past releases because you, you know what your functionalities are and you have tests for those. So with those guidelines, general guidelines in mind, let's actually get down to some specific examples from the collective experiences of our team members. Many of these uh, come from Anshu's work with the E3SM and flash codes. Example one is an ideal case. You're developing a new code and you wanna develop your diagnostics as you're developing the code itself. Taking that extra time to harden the diagnostics into a test suite, and that is, you know, I ran a check and it worked. Well, if I can take that check that I just ran on the terminal and save it as a, save it as a command, and re be able to rerun that command and have it produce a, a, you know, a one or a zero, a yes or a no, did things work? Um, then, I, then I've now turned it into a test, which anyone else can run as well. Um, and not just me who kind of knows what the code should do, it's, it's encoding that into a form the computer can use. Um, let's see, this can save you a lot of headaches later. You'll likely have a lot of comparisons against known expected solutions. And you should try and, um, not just think about comparisons against expected solutions. You also want to take those comparisons and turn them into smaller kind of granular pieces. Um, uh, and I'll show that in a little bit too. Um, the scaffolding idea finds a way to build up a program testing each new piece. Remember to inject errors to your tests so that you know your code will discover erroneous input correctly. Those are test cases with expected fail or um, I'm going to run this test, and if it if it passes, then that's that's counted as an error. As the package gets more complex, it's non-trivial to devise good tests. Nevertheless, good tests are extremely important. Proper testing procedures can also help encourage new contributors. Only recently, I had this experience contributing to a uh, feature to the Alpaca code. Um, the first thing that I did was check that the team wanted the feature before I started writing this thing, um, and then I downloaded their test suite and ran it locally. Um, everything worked and I could build my, my feature in even one line at a time, even though I wasn't familiar with the code, um, the test gave me some confidence that things were working. And so when I finally pushed it into the main repository, I was sure that it was something the team wanted um, and then it would, you know, it's already shown to be working well. 
There's a question here, uh, pros and cons of auto tools, CMake and SCONS. Um, let's see, I, I don't know if I wanna get into a whole discussion of, of these tools, except that um, you have to make your decision on auto tools, CMake or SCONS based on your expertise and your project team's expertise and the applicability of those, those solutions to you know, what you're planning to do. Um, for new projects, I tend to use CMake just because a lot of the, the codes and teams that I work with are also using CMake. But if you're in a, if you're in a world where everyone is using auto tools and there are solutions for importing the packages that you want with auto tools, um, I would say there's probably less development effort to use auto tools. Okay, so on to example two. Here's an example from the E3SM code. That's the Exascale Earth System model. Although advanced now, it originated in a combination of Fortran codes, dealing with various aspects of climate modeling. As a combination of many modules, it was difficult to create an overall testing strategy. Um, and there were not existing tests. So there's kind of a legacy code that comes to you. People were checking the modules as they made them, um, but the combination of modules introduces new potential for problems and the, um, and the tests start to become more and more uh, complicated with this combination. And so the strategy that uh, was adopted here was actually to isolate a small area of the code. So here I'm showing um, with Fortran, you get um, nice module imports so that you can actually you know, see every module and what it's importing as a module. Um, so this is kind of the chain of module imports. And if you isolate a small section of the code, now you're dealing with you know, a module and some sub-modules, which makes, um, which makes the, the test space smaller. Next, um, in this example of the code, there, there's a complicated state that has to do with you know, the state of the world at a particular point. And in order to test the module, you have to run the program once and capture that state. Here, I believe it was captured into a, into a large data file, which could then be read in. Um, of course, that means that you need a driver which reads and writes this data file. Um, and during the testing, you can have the driver read the state. Now, there are some uh, complications to this process because the driver might require some external modules to read the state. Um, and that's mostly okay unless those external modules start making a giant include path and then you're, you're not isolating your tests very well. So this red dot is showing um, an example of a Fortran module which had to be you know, partially rewritten in order to be used inside the driver. So a partial rewrite goes in here. Um, but finally, the end, the end result is that you're able to run your test by pulling the state in. Um, the driver can read the state, exercise the small piece of code. And um, by doing that and making this test modular, something that took a couple hours to run on a supercomputer now became a new unit test that took about 20 seconds to run on a developer's laptop. Um, and there are obvious advantages for testing and develop, being able to test this way as you develop. Hmm. Should now be showing example three, structuring test to pinpoint bugs. I'll take everyone's silence and say yes. Um, okay, so structuring test to pinpoint bugs is example three. And in this example, um, this is where you are trying to uh, trying to build up a set of tests uh, intentionally so that you can make them um, cover larger and larger segments of code. So you start, it's kind of a bottom-up picture where you start with unit tests on components, um, running those components, um, even if you need to put in some, um, some fake infrastructure in order to run the components as simple components. Um, and then you can build up to um, build up a scaffolding to test the components at the top by importing all the components at the bottom that have already been tested. Um, what is shown by these circles is um, gray is a um, gray is an isolated test that doesn't depend on other pieces of the code working. Um, so this unit test it has um, any dependencies are are completely you know written as a simple um, simple mock implementations that always work. And the, um, the unit test itself is looking at only one piece of the code. Once this unit test is shown to succeed, you can now use um, this module in tests of modules that import it. Um, so here, this is a, a module that's being tested with a real dependency, um, this one. And this makes it easier to write this test because we don't have to write a, you know, a shim 
um, or a, a fake underlying implementation. And then finally, you can start to test the entire program at the, at the highest level, and you'll know that um, an error that's occurred at, incurred at this level is due to the collection of modules and not due to an individual module because you've already tested all the individual modules. So let's um, give a little bit more detail on that example. Um, inside of the, um, I put the code name here, the flash code, um, there is a set of structured tests which start from testing uh, halo fill, which I talked about already before. Um, and that halo test works uh, kind of like how you'd expect. There's, um, rather than taking real data, which, which would mean that it's dependent on other pieces of the code, this is going to use a, um, a known function to initialize all of the cells in the center, um, and then maybe fill the guard cells with zeros or fill the guard cells with a, a nonsensical value. And now when the halo exchange is done, these guard cells auto match the known function result. Um, and that is the, um, the essence of the test that we wanna check for equivalence with the known fill pattern. After the halo exchange happens, the halos ought to be correct. Um, this is a simple modular uh, piece of test that now verifies that when you build things on top, of, um, on top of this code, that at least the halo exchange is working. And you can think about all the MPI ranks as one continuous um, coverage of the entire domain. Next, we can build another test that's, that's a, a small unit level test that is uh, testing the equation of state. Things like, is the energy consistent with the pressure? Um, and that equation of state test, will look at, at just whether the equation of state is giving us the correct example. Um, so here's the, the gray circle picture to show you that these are isolated tests, testing both the guard cells and the equation of state. Now, once you've done that, you can start to build um, probably more scientifically interesting test cases like the test for the set of blast wave. Uh, the set of blast wave is simulated using the grid cell equation of state previously tested. Um, it has a known analytical solution, which provides an error estimate for the implementation. And out of tolerance errors at this stage uh, indicate a problem specific to the hydrodynamics, since the cells, uh, the guard cell fill and the equation of state have already been tested. In addition, if you plot errors against time and space, that helps to uh, train new graduate students. So this test is also serving you know, a dual purpose of, of onboarding new team members. So here's the picture. You have these two tests already performed. And now when you're testing the hydrodynamics module, you simply run the code and exercise both of the, the um, components that have already been tested. However, um, there's, there's farther to go to, uh, lots of features have been added to this code. What's shown here is an adaptive mesh refinement. If you wanted to test adaptive mesh refinement, of course, you'd wanna know that the, um, the unrefined grids are working first. Um, and then start to add even more pieces. So next, um, you can take something that's already working on a uniform grid. And if we know that it's working up to this stage, we can now run the hydro um, without the adaptive uh, mesh refinement. That's what I just showed. If we turn on adaptive mesh refinement, um, but not you know, the next level of, of features in the code, and we find a fault in the solution, we know that that happened from the, um, the addition of adaptive mesh refinement. And kind of one of the most complicated pieces in adaptive mesh, re mesh refinement is, is looking at the new boundaries that happen in between um, grid cells, which I guess is called the flux correction. If all of this is working, uh, so you know green circle so far, and you run hydro with the adaptive mesh refinement and you turn on something called dynamic refinement, which is um, where the mesh is refined dynamically in time, um, this is yet another level of difficulty because the regridding is needed. That's that's where um, the refinement can move and you know unrefine the course and and and, um, and uh, refine the grid as a function of time. And so you're able to test all of these different things by starting simple. Um, and now you know exactly if you if you find an error, you know exactly where the error came from. As a final example, um, I wanna point out that there are ways to use a, um, a coverage matrix in order to um, check what you think are the important um, functionalities of your code with what is actually being tested. And the, the idea of the coverage matrix is that there are many different types of physics which are implemented with many different kinds of computer science, um, you know, computer science data objects and modules. So, 
if you simply make a map of the kinds of physics that you are simulating and the the different modules of your code, you can ask yourself about each one of your tests and uh, fill in, <clears throat> for example, um, there is a CL test, which actually exercises AMR with these different kinds of physics. And, and so if you go through in the following order, the, the unit tests, test sensitive to perturbations, uh, the most stringent tests for solvers go in from uh, least complex test to uh, the most complex test, you can find out ooh, where the coverage is in this, um, have a nice summary graph. And the summary graph can communicate information to the domain scientists as well, who can, can say, well, you know, maybe hydro with fast Fourier transform isn't very important. So we don't need a test covering the space, or they may say, you know, testing gravity with adaptive mesh refinement could be important for a new application. So we wanna spend some effort developing this test. Um, and these are the sorts of ways that you can communicate the, the coverage of your test in it and, and um, to the, the science domain experts. As some final takeaways for this module, um, it's really important to understand the context that testing exists in. Um, testing needs time and effort and it, it costs development effort. However, it can give you confidence that the base of your code is working, um, that you can't get any other way. You should devise your tests to enable quickly pinpointing the errors um, or where the errors sit in your code so that you, if, you're, if a test fails um, or if it's expected to fail, you know exactly um, what piece of the code is responsible. You should think about testing as, as a, a combination of different levels of testing. There's um, kind of bottom up looking from, from the, the units uh, all the way up through integration. Um, that is the connection between the units and how they run on the real system. And you also want to have uh, various complexities of tests that are, you know, fast, quick checks for error and longer running tests. Um, and you want to think about a, a holistic validation strategy that lets you, you know, think about um, the entire program and how it's running and build tests that, that work um, locally in each part of your code. Questions on this module?